The grizzly bear has been honed by evolution to be the perfect predator. It can weigh up to 600 pounds or 300 kilograms. It can run faster than any horse and certainly faster than any human. It is at the top of its food chain and is able to chase, catch, and consume any land animal in North America. Its Latin name is Ursus horribilis, the horrible bear. When I was a young man, I herded cattle, horses, and tourists through the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming. I wasn't just comfortable in the wilderness, I craved it. The solitude of wild, rugged landscapes and wild, rugged animals like the grizzly bear, mountain lion, deer, elk, they forged my character and they fed my soul. So when I graduated from high school, college was not enticing. So I didn't go. Instead, I joined the state agency that monitors and tracks and protects grizzly bears. What better way, I thought, for me to expand and extend my love of the wilderness than to study these animals? I was wrong. Typically, when I would travel through the backcountry, I would intentionally avoid grizzly bears or I'd make loud noises to scare them away. Now, in this job, I was trying to find grizzly bears and trying to sneak up on them. <laughs> Studying their carnivorous habits brought that knowledge from the background into the foreground. I was terrified. During the day, as I was walking on trails, a branch would break, and I was absolutely sure that it was a grizzly bear ready to eat me. I would see a stump and was sure that it was a grizzly bear ready to eat me. At night, lying in my tent was the worst. I thought that I was a grizzly bear burrito. <laughs> and I was going to be the, chen, the tender, chewy center. I, at the age of 18, tough, macho kid, didn't uh, sleep for a week. I would cry all night in terror. I didn't eat for four days. So the wilderness of Wyoming had been transferred, transformed from heaven on earth to hell on earth. At night, I would try and count sheep in order to fall asleep. And instead, inevitably, I would find myself counting grizzly bear teeth. 42. Grizzly bear has 42 teeth. So then one day, uh, in the middle of the summer, just south of Yellowstone National Park, we happened upon a 500-pound male grizzly bear. He was a monster. And he was eating the carcass of a deer that had probably died in a winter avalanche and had only been recently uncovered by melting snow. He had eaten 200 pounds of meat, the equivalent for us of a 60-pound hamburger in one sitting. So we approached him to conduct our medical tests. Our adrenaline was pumping. We had our guns drawn. And he rolled over on his back, lazily waved a massive claw in our direction, and went back to sleep. We conducted our tests and left. No drama, no danger, um, no damage. So this encounter entirely changed my opinions. I had found that many of my assumptions and fears about grizzly bears were wrong. And as a result, I also gained self-confidence. I decided that perhaps I could go to other environments that were equally harsh with equally nasty predators and perhaps survive and maybe even thrive. So I left Wyoming and I became an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so fast forward 25 years. I was part of a small team in Palo Alto that was making a smartwatch. We were taking all of the functionality of a smartphone and putting it into a small package. The office was about three miles from Apple and three miles from Google. So we wanted to keep this a secret. We operated in stealth mode in the hopes that once we launched a product, we would get a jump on our competitors, including these tech behemoths, so we could gain some early market share and some profits. We were very well funded. We had a partnership with Foxconn, which is the world's largest manufacturer of consumer electronics. We had a team of motivated Silicon Valley veterans. And we had a product that was packed with interesting technologies. When we launched the product into the market, 
Nobody bought it. This was a disaster. Perhaps it had been because we didn't talk to customers because we were in, in stealth mode, but I didn't know. So I vowed to search for the recipe that would help entrepreneurs create successful, disruptive businesses that would provoke change in entire industries. The first part of this recipe is 400 years old. Copernicus and Galileo observed celestial movements, and they concluded that conventional wisdom was wrong. The sun did not move around the earth. Instead, the earth moves around the sun. Galileo said, truths are easy to understand once they've been discovered. The point is to discover them. Their legacy to us is the scientific method, where we declare assumptions, and then we reconstruct those assumptions into falsifiable hypotheses, which we test with direct evidence. Let me give you the epilogue for the smartwatch company. We were running low on money, running low on motivation. We looked for buyers for the company, and we didn't find any. We had always assumed that Google would be indifferent or perhaps even antagonistic to our efforts. But the CEO uh, set up a meeting anyway. He sold the company to Google in 43 minutes. He had had an assumption that he decided to test with direct evidence, and as a result, he dramatically improved the outcome for all of us. In order to find further nuances of this recipe for successful entrepreneurship, I study business incubators, including the Holt Prize, which is a sister organization to the Holt International Business School. Every year, thousands of students from hundreds of different schools compete to design new ventures that solve global problems. And if they win, they get a million dollars to launch their venture. Last year, for example, the challenge was how to design a venture that would bring 10 million people in urban slums out of poverty in 10 years. So here are some empirical results from my studies. First, the entrepreneurs who used the scientific method did 2.6 times better than entrepreneurs that relied on midnight epiphanies or gut instinct. This statistic also shows you that there are lots of entrepreneurs who are still relying on midnight epiphanies and gut instincts. The second finding is that for every hypothesis that an entrepreneur confirmed with direct evidence as being valid, their chance of success in the competition increased by 3.3%. For every hypothesis they confirmed, success went up by 3.3%. Even more interesting, though, is that for every hypothesis they rejected, using direct evidence to determine that the assumption was invalid, their success went up by 4.6%. What explains this difference? Why is rejection so much more powerful than confirmation? So for this, we need to move beyond just the process of the scientific method to start to understand the mind of the person conducting the scientific method. So let me introduce you to Angel. Angel was my mule in the back country. She carried all of my gear. And Angel kicked. When she was happy, she kicked. When she was sad, she kicked. In the morning, she kicked. At night, she kicked. I'd say hello, she'd kick. I'd put stuff on her, she'd kick. I'd ask her to walk, she'd kick. She was incredibly stubborn. In fact, she was stubborn as a mule. <laughs> Entrepreneurs are also similarly obstinate. And we are prone to confirmation bias, which means that we subconsciously interpret new evidence as supporting what we already believe to be true. So it's possible that entrepreneurs who have collected lots of confirmed hypotheses are not actually on their way to a perfect venture, but instead just demonstrating their bias. On the other hand, entrepreneurs who have collected and rejected hypotheses are demonstrating objectivity, that they are willing to listen to and follow the data. This study of the Holt Prize and other incubators has led to also another interesting 
uh, conclusion around self-confidence. Entrepreneurs who are already self-confident in their ability to eventually find a profitable business are much more likely to use the scientific method. Furthermore, entrepreneurs, whether they started with self-confidence or not, who use the scientific method increase their self-confidence to use ev evidence, which means that they're not only perfecting the business that they're working on now at the time, but they're also perfecting their decisions far into the future. This echoes my own experience with that grizzly bear. Tested some assumptions, rejected them, and found that I was more self-confident for future performance. Musana is a company that illustrates this point. These were students who entered the Hull Prize with the desire to create a more economical food cart for street vendors, starting in Kampala, Uganda. The founder, Natalie, told me, all of our initial assumptions were wrong. Now, I confess, I must bear some responsibility for this. These were students of mine, and some of those wrong assumptions had been my suggestions. She said it was incredibly painful. Just when they thought they had found a solution that solved a problem and they were getting excited about it, they, they determined that they had to go to, into a different direction. They persevered. They continued to test and reject assumptions until they found the right ones. Muzana was a finalist in the Hull Prize competition and is now offering different food cart solutions in several different locations in East Africa. So the search for a successful venture for an entrepreneur, just like wandering through the Wyoming wilderness, can be torturous and terrifying. But if we declare our assumptions, structure them as hypotheses, collect evidence, test our hypotheses, confirm, and even better, reject our hypotheses, we end up with better entrepreneurial outcomes that are more likely to capture consumer demand. Moreover, we develop uh, self-confidence. We become better entrepreneurs for future startups and future decisions. So let me summarize this in a sentence. Entrepreneurs create success and improve self-confidence through rejection. This was true for grizzly bear biologists. It was true for high-tech entrepreneurs. It's true for students in the Hulk Prize. And I contend that it will be true for you. Thank you.